All right, so um, last time we did um, how to walk and kind of went through the more or less standard um, MPC stack for <laughs> that was just jarring. It was surprisingly loud. I wasn't really sure what was going on there. So we talked about kind of the cheetah control stack. Um, and um, I don't know, that stuff's interesting. Uh, so today, uh, kind of, the, you know, I think this is maybe the last one of these case study deals. Um, we're going to talk about driving, how to drive. And um, as part of this, kind of getting a little bit off into some more researchy fun stuff. I'm going to teach you guys a little bit of game theory. Um, specifically this uh, game theoretic MPC stuff that we did in my lab a couple of years ago, uh, which is kind of fun, which lets you reason about like non sort of non-cooperative, you know, driving scenarios. We have to reason about other cars and what other drivers are going to do and, you know, merging and that kind of stuff. It's super fun. So we'll maybe do a little kind of quick, Talk about Nash games and stuff. All right, so um, I wanted to start as as we've been doing with a little history. Um, so for for autonomous driving generally, um, kind of interesting. Uh, I guess autonomous driving is almost as old as driving. Um, there's primitive demos that were done um, as early as like the 1920s. Uh, there was stuff in the 20s and 30s, which is kind of wild. Um, and kind of most of these things, what they would, they were based on embedding like kind of uh, tracks in under the road service and magnets and stuff like this. So they, they kind of made these like, you know, they, they basically engineered things into the road, right? To make the, the problem easier. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I think there were demos like in the 50s with autonomous buses with like bus lanes, dedicated bus lanes and stuff like this. So kind of interesting how far back it goes. Um, but if you kind of like look at, you know, where we are today and kind of turn the clock back, the first kind of like serious modern work traceable to like what we have now um, goes back to the 80s and pretty much CMU. CMU has been like the, the major driving powerhouse. There was also some work in Europe, specifically in Germany, that was like funded by Mercedes-Benz. And so some German universities doing stuff. But really, yeah, it, it, it really all like kind of all started here, which is pretty awesome. Um, and... Um, To kind of, I want to show a quick video of some of that stuff. Quick poll. Um, when do you guys think the first autonomous coast-to-coast -coast drive was across the U.S.? It is from CMU. It is from CMU. What year do you think it was? Should be around 1980s. And... So, so it's later than that, but it's earlier than I would have thought. Uh, if you kind of, you know, have followed this stuff the last few years like um so uh i'll just show it to you uh this is this is it it was navlab 5 1995 they called it no hands across america that's it so what they basically they retrofitted a minivan and like the entire back of the van was full of computers it was like what it took to do this back then but um and so it was all vision based right but this was like 1995 so for the time insanely impressive and then this jumps forward to the darpa stuff like a decade later, the dark the offer a driving challenge. But yeah, so 1995 was the first coast to coast like cross country highway drive. Uh, I think it was 95 percent autonomous. Basically, like they had a safety driver, they'd have to take over if anything weird happened. So like if you were going through a construction site or weird weather and like the vision system crapped out, but still 95 percent autonomous in 1995. So highway driving has been kind of almost solved for. 30 years, right? That was 30 years ago. It's wild to think about like, you know, how far back, like the fact that it was that good 30 years ago really just illustrates how much of like a long tail problem this is, right? Like we've gone from 95% 30 years ago to maybe like 98, 99% now. And like, you know, it took 30 years to get like four more percent 
And like that last percent, I feel like we're going to be chasing for decades. Like it's, it's, you know, it's a long tail problem. Anyway, I think that's a fun, a fun anecdote. And also just like kind of a, a fun, also like CMU, you know, story. Um, okay. So lots of stuff. Um, it, this stuff's kind of really blew up in the, in the nineties, um, And these, at that point, people were getting like 95% plus autonomy on like long highway drives. Um, there were similar demos, by the way, to that CMU one in, in Germany. There were like similar sort of, you know, Autobahn long road trip type demos at like that 95% autonomy level. Um, so there are multiple groups are working on it. Uh, and then the, like the real, where everyone really started to pay attention to this stuff and it sort of, you know, really sparked a ton of excitement and like industry investment was the DARPA challenge, which is that, that second video. Like, I think, how many of you guys were around for that? Like, yeah, it's funny. I was an undergrad. I think I was like a freshman or sophomore when that stuff was happening. Um, and I remember seeing it like as an undergrad, um, but yeah, so that DARPA challenge stuff, uh, which again, major CMU, you know, connections there. And obviously CMU won the second one, which was a huge deal. Uh, so that was kind of early 2000s, right? Like 2005-ish. Um, and that basically what happened there, right? There were all these university teams, CMU, Stanford, Cornell, MIT, and Really, basically, what happened is it was like this DARPA thing kind of really kickstarted development, uh, and and all these teams made a ton of progress in a, over like two three years, and then essentially all those teams like went out and founded all the autonomous driving companies that we know today. Like they either got acquired or whatever. There's been a lot of action there, but pretty much you can trace you can trace all of the the car the the company efforts of the last decade in autonomous driving to one of these teams, one or more of these teams. Right, the Stanford team basically turned into Waymo, um, the CMU team actually spawned a few companies, uh, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. So this, the, this DARPA challenge really like catalyzed a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, so that's that. Uh, so now to like kind of talk about what the kind of full stack looks like for one of these things. Um, you've got, uh, like kind of last, sort of like how we had last time, there's like a perception slash state estimation thing. Um, then there's sort of, these things generally have pretty complicated planning stacks, but I think we'll, for our purposes, we'll kind of divide this into two things. There's like a path planner that's kind of trying to, you know, design a collision free trajectory over some horizon. And then on top of that, there's some kind of higher level flannel planner that's um this is at the level of like Google Maps or whatever. This is designing, this is like route planning. Um then this path planner thing goes into an MPC controller. And then that kind of more or less gets run on the car with some kind of, you know, low level stuff actually, you know, controlling the the motor torque and like the steering. Uh, cool. And then you've got your sensors and everything, and this all gets fed back. Okay. So that's high level, how most of these things look. Um, and then sort of what's in these things, um, sensor wise, most of these cars, you know, have some combination of GPS, IMUs, cameras, um, radars, and LIDAR. And um, I, from my perspective, I guess, I, I think I would argue that the hard part of all of this, you know, there's exceptions to this, but I would say most of the hard part is in the perception part. The control problem here, like the MPC and, and down part, even the path planning part is like not particularly hard. Perception is really, really hard uh, for this stuff. 
Um, another kind of hard part, which it's unclear actually where it belongs in this diagram is, is basically just like reasoning about other drivers, like what, what humans are going to do if you're out there in the wild, you've got pedestrians, bikes, and other cars and people being weird and doing weird things all the time. And that's super hard to predict. So there's a, this problem of like reasoning about it's, it's not even a predict, it's a perception problem. It's a prediction problem, but it's even worse than that. It's like this coupled interaction problem because you as the the ego vehicle the the car trying to drive like your actions are coupled into the other driver's actions right so like your behavior can influence their behavior in kind of these weird ways and it's really complicated and hard to model um mostly because humans are weird and irrational uh, but yeah so that's super hard too uh okay so then just to kind of walk through the other pieces here you've got um high level planner that's really doing route planning. Um, with graph search kind of techniques. Um, this is generating waypoints. So these are like the directions. Uh, then this, this sort of path planner thing. Um, this is generating like sort of a nominal smooth trajectory for the car to follow. Um, so like this would be like this generally generates some kind of smooth spline trajectory. Um, and the, what this thing's really trying to do is generate smooth collision free paths. It doesn't reason about the car dynamics. It's trying to generally just be reasonable not hit anything and generate like smooth paths. Um, and then this basically gets shoved into an MPC controller as a reference to track. Okay, and so yeah, we're basically going to talk about this part because that's kind of you know our our sort of whole reason for being here. Um, and so to get into this, I'm we're going to take a little trip through kind of vehicle modeling a little bit, how you write down models for these things, what the standard models look like, which is a little bit surprising, frankly, how dumb they are. Yeah. The path planner generates the path that some small dynamics support. Is there any path planner that does the dynamics? Um, I mean it's. This breakdown and the structure that I've, you know, sort of just drawn out here is arbitrary, right? You could design the stack a whole bunch of ways. You could draw the lines different ways between these these modules. What I've done here, this is basically more or less standard. This is what a lot of driving stacks look like. You don't have to do it this way. Uh, this is just like how it's been done in many, many cases. So I don't know. This isn't right or wrong. This isn't like, you know, optimal or anything like this is just a thing that has worked that many teams have have done um yeah so that that like path planner thing it's trying to design a like a smooth collision free path so it's trying to like find a you know some smooth trajectory that doesn't hit anything basically knowing what you know where the obstacles are where the other cars are blah 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 it's just trying to weave a smooth path through those things um so it's trying to do basically one way to say this is as we've seen, like trajectory optimization is kind of bad about de reasoning about dense obstacles. So if you try to like, you know, the classic one is like a maze or like a, you know, kind of thing that's weaving through, you know, like drone weaving through the forest kind of thing. If you hand trajectory optimization, like no initial guess and a ton of obstacles, it's pretty bad. It like tends to get stuck easily, this kind of thing. So what's going on, the kind of the real reason for this is the MPC controller, um, if you give it a, some random path and a lot of collision obstacles, it's going to suck. And it's probably going to, you know, not converge well. So the idea here is you're trying to offload that hard. The problem that's hard for the MPC controller, this generate a collision-free path, 
it's it's hard for MPC, but it's pretty easy for sample-based planners, essentially, right? So the idea here is you're trying to use sample-based planning, whatever, something like that, graph planning, methods that are good at reasoning about finding collision-free paths. You put that in that path planner. Then basically what comes out of the path planner doesn't know the dynamics, but it's collision-free. And, and then MPC is good at reasoning about the dynamics, but bad. So you know what I mean? Do the complementary thing. So this is this idea of interleaving like sample-based planning or graph planning with Tragopt is very common. And they are very complementary. Basically like graph planning or sample-based planning um, is, is really good about reasoning about obstacles, but really bad at reasoning about dynamics. MPC is really good at reasoning about dynamics and relatively bad about reasoning about lots of collisions. So that you kind of use each one for its strength and you hook them together. So you're essentially taking the collision-free path from the path planner, um, in most cases, you're actually baking in the collision constraints also in the MPC problem, but you're handing it a trajectory that's already feasible with respect to the collisions that just doesn't obey the dynamics super nicely. So you're saying, you know, track this nominal trajectory, which is already not hitting anything. Don't hit anything. You put the constraints in there too, and also obey the dynamics. So all the MPC planner has to, MPC controller now has to do is kind of like generate a like dynamically feasible path close to the reference while not hitting anything. And you've already given it something that doesn't hit anything that's kind of close, right? Does that make sense? Cool. How do you know the path of the path is going to be like relatively close to something that is easy? Yeah. So the trick is this smoothness thing. You basically, rather than having it like able to like plan a whole bunch of weird sample points on some graph, you think you force it to use a spline representation. And then you, you can basically enforce by forcing it to use a polynomial representation for the path you can control the smoothness. So you basically give it something that can't wiggle too aggressively, and then that's likely to be... So you're just assuming that it's smooth enough that the car can follow. Yeah, I mean, basically what that comes down to at, at that point is just like, what's the turning radius of the car? How fast are you driving, blah, blah, blah. So as long as you're not doing insane, aggressive, you know, <laughs> stuff, um, this approach is pretty good. You, you basically you kind of constrain the path planner like by construction, by kind of forcing it to use these low order spline curves, it can't generate anything that's too aggressive, right? It, it kind of only can spit things out that are relatively smooth. And then like that, so that's kind of how you hook them together. And you kind of like have reasonable confidence that the path planner essentially can't generate anything that's too crazy for the NPC to track reasonably well. Yep. The high level planner is basically given the destination and the path planner is like- Yeah, that, that high level thing is, is basically giving you waypoints. So th that thing's reasoning about like the directions from like your house to the grocery store, right? It's giving you like the, the street direction, that that like waypoint kind of stuff. Okay, the path planner is just uh, kind of uh, generating paths over a finite horizon. Yeah, so path planner has perception information. So it knows where obstacles are. And basically it's looking ahead more or less over your sensor horizon, like as far as you can see, right? Ahead, it's gonna plan a collision-free path you know, over some, you know, whatever kind of distance you can, you can see with your sensors, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, whatever. Um, you know, that's, it's trying to say, okay, knowing where all the obstacles are, some of these may be time varying, whatever, knowing where everything is right now, as far as I can see, I'm going to plan a smooth curve that doesn't hit any of that stuff that gets me, you know, in the direction I want to go. You take that smooth curve that's collision free, you throw it in the MPC controller, which, um, again, is nominally kind of bad at reasoning about collision constraints. Like you can kind of do it, but it's pretty bad at finding crazy weavy paths through lots of obstacles. So you give it one of those a priori, put in the constraints, but it's already respecting the constraints. And then you say, okay, now now figure out the dynamics and track this thing. Yeah. So is the high level, high level planner like a star or something like that? Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, in many cases, they are differentially flat systems. Like you can model them this way. Um, I don't know, you know, the extent to which any of that actually is used in in these practical settings. Maybe, maybe not. Yes, like I'm also kind of curious about how GPS like plays such a big role because how's the you're not looking that far ahead i mean you know basically like you're saying here so so there's lots of sensor fusion going on in here you're, you're fusing gps lidar radar imu blah 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 odometry like all this stuff to try to get a good state estimate a lot of vision right like gps gets you within you know 
nominally 10 meters with aggressively designed receivers. You can do better than that. You can get down to kind of a couple meters, but the, the way to say it is GPS on its own is not good enough to do lane keeping. Like just vanilla GPS cannot keep you in the center of a lane. So you have to fuse it with vision and other things, right? Um, to make one of these work. Yeah. So to actually find the controls that we're going to get, so we do that U equals negative K X minus X Z, right? Uh, I'm not following. Actually, when I use a control, we do U is equal to K X. I mean, so that's linear feedback. Yeah. So that may or may not be happening in here. So like, you know, there's various levels of, so this thing is spitting out, you know, some dynamically feasible trajectory for the car. Yeah. Uh, and some nominal steering commands and things like that. That goes into some low level controller that's more, probably more like hand tuned PD loops on the throttle, the steering wheel commands, et cetera. That's then tracking what comes out of the MPC. If that makes sense. So there's definitely linear feedback loops in here in various places. That's kind of abstracted into this box here at this point. Uh, so yeah, like, MPC here is generating like reference, you know, acceleration. Oh, we'll we'll write it down in a second. It may be clear. The MPC is using a pretty simple model, so it's not necessarily direct. Like it's basically steering angle, uh, you know, and uh, maybe acceleration, which then have to get translated into low level commands for the actual cars throttle and whatever. So I'm do x minus x to, to find the error. Yeah. It only gives us the location, but yeah, yeah, time. You're right. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, there's different ways of doing this, but mm -hmm. often the MPC is what's figuring that out for you. And there's there's sort of different ways of formulating that MPC problem. Um, there's uh, in many driving scenarios and other scenarios too, like drone racing, you reformulate this problem um, over rather than the free variable being time, the free variable's path length. So if you're trying to track some reference trajectory, you can basically like make it like normally, right? We have T and we integrate in time for the cost function and everything. What you can do instead is reparameterize it as, as like some path length S. And then the controller, the MPC controller can basically decide what the velocity is, like how, how fast you follow, go along the path. If you're doing racing, you just say maximum, maximize progress. Right. Um, but there's, there's other reasonable things you can do, like knowing actuator limits you can put, you know, you can like minimize things like jerk or acceleration or whatever to come up with like smooth, you know, things. So I don't know. It's a little, a little weird. But yeah, often in driving, you do not parameterize this as a uh, uh, as time. Uh, you parameterize the path length and then kind of solve for the velocity for exactly the reason you're saying that that like that reference path doesn't have a time index or velocity associated with it. The MPC thing, the MPC part is figuring the velocity out. If I do my path following in like control sticks, like let's say I'm just doing some sort of sensor based map, yeah, each transition you don't, in, not at least not for on drive on on road driving doesn't do that. That's very common in off road driving, like these MPPI techniques. This is not that, but yeah, yeah. I'd be able to just skip the MPC part and then just. I mean that is MPC. That's MPC. Except I'm not doing the. I'm just sampling. You're optimizing though. MPPI, no, you are though. Like MPPI is just an algorithm for solving the MPC problem, just like gradient descent or Newton's method or whatever. That's a, it's it's a it's a class of algorithms that like uh, are like um, there's many instances of these. Like it's basically applying CMA if you're familiar with that, CMA ES. Like it's it's a sampling based approximation of Newton's method actually. Like MPPI is actually very close to Newton's method. It's just another optimization algorithm you're throwing at the problem, but it's not, it is MPC 100%. Like it's not, you should not think, like we do a lecture on this actually, this is fun. Um, if you're actually curious about the connections between Newton's method and all the stuff we've talked about and MPPI sample-based stuff, Guan Yashi in our department just, just has a recent paper out like a month or two ago called Kovo MPC. Oh yeah, there you go. You should read his paper. <laughs> It it basically is very explicitly drawing these connections between MPPI and Newton's method and like, uh, yeah, look it up. Talk to him after class. It's a good paper. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> Should I... But yeah, yeah. So these things are deeply connected. It is just MPC. It's just a different way of solving the MPC problem. The reason you do it, by the way, is that in a lot of these off-road driving scenarios, you're using like crazy learned models of dynamics and maps and stuff like this, and often 
neural networks, uh, like if, unless you try really hard to design them very carefully, they tend to have, they tend to basically have crap derivatives. There are a lot, in many active, like ReLU's non-differentiable, right? They have kinks and stuff. Unless you try really hard where, and choose special kind of activations and regularize in special ways, like generally speaking, it's hard to get neural networks to be nicely differentiable. And um, doing Newton's method on a neural network is terrible because you'd need two derivatives and they're generally crap. So um, the reason to do MPPI in those contexts actually is so you can use neural network cost functions, the, these traversability maps, right? And neural network dynamics models uh, and not have to worry about differentiating through the neural net. Because then you just like the, the, the deal, what, what the MPPI stuff's really doing is throwing a bunch of samples through your cost function and through your dynamics. It's basically using the samples to evaluate a gradient step, right? And it's it's really close to Newton's method, actually. Uh, it turns out the covariance, may, a la this connection between uh, trajectory optimization, the duality between trage op and estimation that we talked about, the covariance matrix of the sampling distribution there is very closely related to the Hessian in Newton's method. It's basically the inverse Hessian. So these things are deeply connected. This got off on a very long tangent, but yeah. So these things are not as different as you might've thought. Everything is connected. All right, anyway. Okay, moving on. Sorry, I'm easily distracted. Uh, so let's talk about some vehicle dynamics for a sec. Um, and this is actually like, what I'm about to tell you, right, is very applicable to on-road driving. Where this has really diverged a lot is on-road driving, you can use simple toy models, blah, blah, blah. Things mostly work. Off-road driving is a completely different story. It's a huge mess. And so um, whereas like on-road driving, a lot of classical control stuff, MPC standard stuff applies. Off-road driving, people have like really gone for very different techniques because of the modeling challenges there. Um, okay, so let's see. There's lots of options for these models. Uh, with kind of different levels of fidelity. And the really interesting thing for me is um, how simple and dumb most of the models are that you can get away with in these things. So the most common models used in, in these driving controllers, the MPC controllers, um, are so-called bicycle or single track models. And within those, there's even more variation. Um, so I will show you the simplest one and then we will talk about um, the more complicated one. So the simplest model, which actually works in a lot of settings is called the kinematic bicycle model. And it is super dumb, but sort of works surprisingly, um, but it has limitations. We'll talk about the limitations. So if you're in 2D, you got kind of like X, Y, theta, coordinates, um, then the way this thing looks, you've got a back wheel that sort of is uh, fixed. You've got a front wheel that you can turn. Um, the distance between the axles here, call L, and then this turning angle here, we will call alpha. And then this heading angle here, uh, you know, versus your corner frame, we'll call theta. So there's a couple angles involved. And then basically in this guy, we're assuming um, the reason it's called the kinematic model, you're assuming the direct control over the velocity and the steering angle. You can easily like add an integrator to the dynamics and assume that you have control over alpha dot. That's easy to do. And similarly, you can add integral to the, the velocity and assume you, you like, you know, have acceleration control. Um, so that's kind of the kinematic part comes from assuming you basically have direct velocity and heading angle control or steering angle control. Um, and then there's a couple other things that come in here. Um, so assuming the tires don't slip, you can kind of just kind of turn the crank on this and get some kinematic stuff, do a little trig. It's pretty easy. So like X dot is V cos theta, Y dot is V sine theta, uh, theta dot is... V tan alpha over L. Um, and then, yeah, you can, if you kind of 
you know, add this integrator, you can say this is equal to U2. And then your state ends up being um, X, Y, theta, alpha. And then U is going to be your velocity and then like alpha dot your steering. Um, this is pretty benign. This works surprisingly well for like normal on-road driving. So like very benign, like driving around on the road, not pushing the vehicle limits, not, you know, accelerating super hard or like cornering super hard. Um, this will work, you know, for that kind of stuff. In, in air quotes. Um, where might this break down? Thoughts? No, this works great for parallel parking. Yeah, yeah. There's, no, it, this has all the kinematic. Parallel parking is a kinematic problem, right? It's about how do you like, so this totally works for parallel parking. In fact, you can throw this into IOQR and do parallel parking, no problem. It's actually surprisingly easy. Hmm? Yeah, this will not do drifting, 100%. We're going to talk about that in a sec. So yeah, so th basically anything where you're really pushing the vehicle limits, if you're pushing, like, so this this assumes I have direct velocity control. If I try to like instantaneously change velocity, like if I, if I wanna go from zero to 60, like if I try to do that, I can't, right? So this is assuming you're not accelerating super hard, you're not cornering super hard, you're not pushing the tire grip limits, right? Like any anything like that, where you're like driving, basically really aggressive driving. So basically like, you know, drifting, racing, or or like maneuvering in like emergency situations, right? Um, so from here, but this, yeah, this handles parallel parking. This handles like easy driving um, where you can go from here to like get into crazier scenarios. The next thing up from here is called the dynamic bicycle model. And that one's actually probably the sweet spot for most on the road kind of things. Um, and what that does is it's still this bicycle model, this single track model where you're kind of lumping the, the front and back wheels together, um, but it models the car as a rigid body and actually does F equals MA stuff. So you've got, you know, you're looking at the actual forces and torques And um, this can reason about engine torque, tire forces, you know, braking, tire grip, all all of the things, right? Um, so this can take you really far. In fact, this is good enough to do like racing stuff, like uh, which we'll we'll talk about in a sec. Um, So that can go pretty far. Uh, this can reason about actually surprisingly dynamic and, and aggressive behavior. Um, from here, like the next one up in the kind of hierarchy or complexity is called the double track model. And this is basically the full car model. So now you've got all four tires. You've got um, the 3D rigid body dynamics, suspension. You can reason about body roll now and like loading, you know, the inside versus outside tires differently in a, in a tight cornering scenario, all this kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the full fidelity thing. Uh, yeah, let's see. So this is maybe, uh, maybe, you know, racing, drifting, 
off-road stuff. If you wanted to have like a high fidelity, you know, think about everything and, and like kind of really push the car all the way to its limits. This is kind of what you want. Although I'll, we'll show you some stuff where, again, you can do some insanely aggressive, crazy stuff with the single track, like dynamic bicycle model. And the last thing to say here is that um, when you go push the, the vehicle limits, the, the thing that's actually hardest to model, and at least in the on-road setting that we're talking about here, uh, are the tires. Tire models are insane. Has anyone here looked at these, like the magic tire model and this kind of stuff? It's it's super nasty. It's, it's yeah, kind of, kind of ridiculous. So like, if you try to reason about, you know, um, you know, kind of like friction limits and like slip and, and all this kind of stuff, it gets disgusting basically. And so there's a hierarchy here too. You can basically go from like simple, which would be in that kinematic bicycle model, you're assuming no slip all the time. Uh, so that's kind of the dumbest thing. Uh, and then in the middle, you might have, um, Coulomb friction, like we've talked about a bunch, right? Which can reason about stick slip um, to very complex. Uh, and the very complex stuff, um, these are reasoning about, you know, the size of the contact patch, uh, deformation in the tire, right? Because these things are squishy. And like nonlinear stiffness. So it turns out like in, in like a lot of, at least on-road racing aggressive stuff, this tire modeling ends up kind of being more important than the, than the double track model. So a lot of like crazy stuff like drifting, you can actually do that with the single track, like bicycle, dynamic bicycle model, but you need the complicated tire model to kind of do the drifting stuff, right? It makes sense. You, you need a reason about slipping the tires and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, and then kind of like, Again, for on-road stuff, uh, state-of-the-art here. Um, is generally speaking like some kind of nonlinear MPC. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to do this. Um, most is what most of the car companies are doing. Um, like you don't need the details in many cases, but I've talked to people at car companies specifically who had implemented our papers on their cars. So it's uh, you know, at least somewhat what they're doing. Um, and, and I think a lot of cases they're using basically dynamic bicycle mo models. Um, actually, let me show you some stuff. Let's show you some stuff, but, um, let's show cool things. And then I'll tell you kind of what's going on there. Um, who's seen this before? This is, uh, at Stanford. This is, um, autonomous drifting. Pretty sick. It's also just cool because they did it on a DeLorean style points um so yeah that's super impressive and what else to say about this that's a dynamic bicycle model with a good tire model and doing nonlinear mpc it's not even yeah so the, it's surprising how far you can stretch the simple model it's not even like a full you know double track model it's wild how like this is totally right it's totally autonomous it's like really like the the it's inside those cones it's like you know fitting through these super tight spaces it's like the level of precision is really really impressive considering how insane those dynamics are too right like especially the tire dynamics are super nasty anyway this is awesome um i'll i'll tease um so that's dan uh it's gertie's lab at uh uh chris chris gertie's at stanford um, and there's the dynamic, uh, bicycle model that they used to do it. So it's wild how far you can stretch that. Uh, so Chris Curdy's lab, here's some more from that lab, same lab. This is from a while ago now. Um, this is their, their other car, uh, an Audi TT doing, um, uh, on a racetrack running a time trial. So this is the goal is to get the fastest lap time. There's no other cars, right? Uh, so this is fully autonomous also. And I guess, um, so I was on a few of these guys' committees for a while and like, you know, read some dissertations uh, and like kind of, it was super interesting to me. Um, there's a few things that are really interesting. So, okay, so they're using like, you know, 
single track model, blah, blah, blah. They're doing nonlinear MPC. Um, and they, they basically beat uh, the best amateur racers, but they still lose to professional Formula One drivers. Why? What do you guys think? So this is basically optimal. It's like, you know, pushing the car right up to the limits of, of the model, right? The model on it. So in terms of like, you know, cornering grip, throttle, steering, everything, they're right up against all the all the car's control limits. Yeah. Is this stuff like body rolling or? Um, they're not in here, but they don't, it turns out to not really matter. There's other things that matter more. Yeah. They are, that's actually getting at it. So yeah, so the body roll doesn't matter. Remember we talked about the tire model is actually kind of the most important thing. And it's also weird and uncertain. So these guys have limit friction limits on there. And what the optimal thing to do is, is push right up to those friction limits because you want stiction, you want static friction. If you start to slip, you actually get less grip, right? Because your, your your friction does this, right? So so what the car is doing is what it thinks is optimal, which is putting pushing right up to the friction limit without exceeding it, right? It turns out though, what the, if you look at the data from human trials, where they put a human in there and, and track a bunch of variables, the car goes right up to the limit and never exceeds it. And the limit though, it turns out, right? It changes the function of temperature, where you are on the track, there's gunk on the track, all this stuff, right? So in the model, there's a kind of a conservative friction coefficient estimate in there. Car goes right up to it. Human, on the other hand, if you look at the human data, they're basically slipping a little bit all the time. And what, if you interview these Formula One drivers, what they're doing is basically continuously doing exploration. They're always testing all over the place and they build a mental map of the whole track in their heads of where, what the friction coefficient is like across the entire track that they constantly update. And it changes the temperature and how many laps they've driven and all this kind of stuff. And so they're, they're doing something that's nominally suboptimal, right? They're slipping a lot, but what they're actually doing is updating their estimate of this friction map. And then that lets them push right up. So if you, the humans, they're slipping all the time. They're also, apparently they listen for tire squeal. They're, they're, they're getting force feedback through the steering wheel and sound of, of the squealing and stuff. So it's wild, like the sensor information that humans are using. So they, they, the expert human drivers are still better than this. And it's, and that seems to be the key thing. It's not this body, it's the tire model. And that's the nastiest part of this whole thing. And they're basically yeah, online estimating out uh, these, these friction things. And then you know using that updated information all the time, so kind of constantly adapting online, which is really really interesting. That's not in these autonomy stacks yet. Um, this is the paper uh, from this one. I was on this dude's thesis committee, um, but uh, it's super cool. They go into their their the details of their stack that just was on that car. The takeaway is it's basically nonlinear MPC with a reasonable uh, car model with a reasonable tire model uh, running on IP opt. Uh, it's co-location IP opt. 50 hertz on the car. So it's stuff that you guys have seen. Like basically you can read this paper and implement their model and you have the tools. That's exactly stuff we've talked about in class. Um, Aerodynamic considerations. Cause like if someone's racing on like an oval track, they don't actually follow the center of the track. Like they cut in and at like the- Yeah. To my knowledge, I've never heard these guys talk about aerodynamics very much. I'm sure it matters at some point, um, but I think the stuff that matters more are these tire grip considerations in, in cornering scenarios. Like if you were just going flat on a straightaway, then I think aerodynamics will matter to some extent, but it's still just like, the answer is to floor it and like, you know, get as much power to the engine as you can. The hard stuff is cornering. Like basically you can only go so fast on the, in the corners and it depends critically on your tire grip, like more than anything else. And so that's like, it turns out like the real limiting factor. Uh, okay, so yeah, the story here uh, with this stuff, so that's basically state of the art, right? For for like this kind of on road driving, uh, it's a dynamic bicycle model. With like kind of more sophisticated tire models. And that, you know, gets you surprisingly far. <laughs> and as far as that, like, those videos, um, that's basically just nonlinear MPC uh, running with IP opt uh, at about 50 Hertz. So you guys can probably figure out the details from there by checking out some papers if you wanted to. Um, okay, so that's kind of like, you know, how most of these things work. 
Um, now I wanted to talk about something a little weirder. Um, let's see, do I have a good video for this? I tried to find a good video of this and I, I was kind of coming up short. So I'm going to tell you about it and then I'll show you some like less exciting videos basically than, than a real one. Um, has anyone heard of the frozen robot problem or the freezing robot problem? It's a classic autonomous driving issue. No one's heard of this? All right, sweet. So I'll tell you about it. Okay, so it turns out, you know, um, what a lot of these, you know, autonomy stacks are doing when they're out on the road in the real world, um, they um, need to reason about collisions with other cars, right? And so at some level, this comes down to a prediction problem. You, you know, to, to like put those collision constraints into your MPC controller, you have to know where that car is going to be in the future over your MPC horizon. So you need some way of predicting what the other cars are going to do over the next few seconds into the, like whatever your MPC horizon is. And then you put these collision constraints, right? How do you get there? So the standard dumbest way thing to do, the most obvious thing to do is you basically track your nearest neighbor cars with your perception system and you assume they're going to keep driving at constant velocity. That's the simplest thing to do. And that is what people have done forever. And that's basically why highway driving is a solved problem and like urban driving is not. Like that prediction holds up really well on the highway uh, in most cases. And so like this problem is pretty easy on the highway. As soon as you go into an urban environment, it gets all hell breaks loose and it's like super terrible, right? Um, so other things you can start to do though. So, so that's like an open loop kind of thing though. Even if you use more sophisticated prediction models, uh, like data-driven modeling, which is now very much a thing. There's huge data sets uh, for human drivers and stuff like this. So let's say you you build some giant neural network model. You still end up with this problem of like, you're basically doing these open loop predictions over the MPC horizon based on the recent past into the future. And what these things don't take into account is coupling between your actions and those other drivers' actions. And the classic example, which is often called the frozen robot problem, is if I'm merging onto the highway in uh, in traffic. So if you're like bumper to bumper traffic on the highway, you're coming up down the on-ramp and you need to merge your way in there. In most of these kind of driving stacks, um, and there's been a ton of work on this last few years. So what I'm telling you is maybe a few years out of date and these companies have invested, you know, billions of dollars in this stuff. So, but a, a classic problem is you've got like bumper to bumper traffic. There's not a gap in between those cars that is, that looks collision free as far as your planner and controller are concerned. So what has what is a classic thing is you'll get to the bottom of the on-ramp and like the autonomy stack will just slam on the brakes and sit there and say that it can't merge into traffic. It can't find a collision free trajectory. Um, and the answer, you know, for us is you reason about the other driver's behavior and you say, okay, these other drivers don't want to hit me. They, I don't want to hit them. They don't want to hit me. If I basically like force my way in, if I just start nudging in between these guys, somebody's going to make room. Like that's what we do. Right. And, um, but th this fundamentally relies on this, uh, me having a mental model of what the other driver's behavior is like and reasoning about this cross coupling between my actions and their actions, making, frankly, making a lot of assumptions about rationality and all these other things, but it kind of really deeply at, at some core level relies on this, um, cross coupling of decision-making. Like I have some mental model of their decision-making process. And I'm accounting for that in my decision-making process. I'm making predictions about their, their closed loop behavior, basically, right? Which is a very subtle, complicated thing. And it turns out there is a mathematical framework that addresses exactly this problem, and it is game theory. So we're going to talk a little bit about game theory now. Uh, so I just said lots of things. Let me write some things down. Um, we want the MPC controller for this kind of scenario to reason about coupled behavior with other drivers. Um, a lot of current systems like make a lot of assumptions. about other drivers and essentially make open loop predictions.
Uh, this sort of thing works well for highway driving. Um, it, but it breaks down in like urban scenarios, scenarios with, you know, kind of tighter coupling, like, you know, lots of kind of traffic, that kind of thing. So, you know, uh, et cetera. Okay, cool. So uh, now we're going to talk about game theoretic trajectory optimization, we'll call it. This is a weird, weird special topic for your for your general interest. I think it's cool, but it's like, I don't know. Um, okay, so high level idea. Um, what we're gonna do to do this is like, we're basically gonna assume that all the other cars are also solving an optimal control problem, sort of like mine. So we're all kind of doing the same kind of thing. You can, you know, you're basically assuming they're solving an optimal control problem um, throughout you can actually model their costs and constraints differently. So you can account for, for instance, like more or less aggressive, you know, driving behaviors via your their cost and constraints. So you do stuff like this. We did do stuff like this as, as kind of follow on to the initial stuff I'm gonna show you. So they're not identical control policies, but they're all assumed to be like optimizing something basically. Um, Completely autonomous situation. Like, if every car is autonomous, does every robot, like, does every car produce it? Um, I don't know that anyone's replicated that, like, in hardware. You can do whatever you want in simulation. I haven't seen any papers that have tried this. Um, okay, so we assume everyone's optimizing some optimal control problem simultaneously. Uh, this, by the way, in, in the like game theory or like economics literature is called being rational. That's what it means to be rational. You're optimizing all the time. It's a fun fact. Uh, so what you're going to do then is basically like you in, in your vehicle, you're going to solve a joint optimization problem for all your neighboring cars simultaneously. Because what's going to happen here is like, basically, you know, I'm optimizing for my goal. You know, I have my dynamics and I have collision constraints. My collision constraints depend on the other cars. I'm assuming they're solving a similar problem with costs and dynamics and whatever for their car. They might have a cost and my cost function might also depend on the other cars, right? It might say like, oh, I like to follow farther or closer, you know, whatever. So the costs and constraints, my costs and constraints might have the other cars like positions and velocities in them, right? And similarly, their problems, I'm gonna assume they don't wanna hit me either. So like their collision constraints are gonna have me in there. Similarly, they might have me in their objective function as some like following distance or something kind of, right? So the problems are all, like I'm only optimizing over my controls. I'm not, I can't optimize over theirs. It's non-cooperative in other words. Um, and they're doing the same thing, but they're coupled, right? Cause my state shows up in their problem. Their state shows up in my problem, right? So in some sense, they're separate optimization problems, but they're all cross-coupled in, in weird ways, right? So what we wanna to try to do though is somehow jointly solve these all the problems. Okay, and so one version of what I just described um, is, um, and there's different ways to set this up and it's a little, you know, there's messy details, I guess. But one version of what I just described is uh, called a Nash equilibrium, as in John Nash, you know, beautiful mind, blah, 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 et cetera, uh, that guy.
Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. I always associate him with he's uh, from with Princeton. Fascinating. I never knew that. I only know them. I only watched the movie. I never. Knew that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good to know. Another CMU connection. It's all over the place. Uh, okay. So this Nash equilibrium thing, like, all right, so I'll kind of define this thing. Basically, what we're going to do is it, we're going to define this new variable X bar, which is going to have everybody's states concatenated. And I'm going to use a superscript for vehicle I, basically. So we've got, you know, vehicle one, vehicle two, blah, 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 up to vehicle N, all, all the vehicle states. And then I've got, similarly, I'm going to stack up everybody's controls into this U bar. So I've got all the controls for all the vehicles and the superscript corresponds to vehicle index and then like subscript would be time index, but we're talking vehicles. So these are states and inputs for all cars stacked. Okay, so um, now what this is gonna look like for, for each car, you're gonna get a problem that looks like this. So I'm minimizing over all the states, but only car eyes controls, right? That's that's the definition, right? Because I because car eyes cost function and constraints depend on the other cars, right? But car eye can only affect car eyes um, controls. So I'm basically optimizing over car eyes controls, but I have everybody's states in there. I've got a cost function for car I that depends on everybody's states, but only car eyes controls. And the cars can have different, different cost functions in general, right? To like kind of tailor their behaviors. And then I've got dynamics constraints for everybody. And I've got collision constraints for everybody. What are the collision constraints of a Um, I, I'm just being super general here. They probably wouldn't be, but that could include like actuator limits, right? That kind of thing. So whatever. Do you assume all the cars are solving the same optimization problem? Because one car's goal is not to match another car's goal, especially. So they're they don't have to be identical cost functions or constraints. We're assuming they're all solving some optimization problem. Everybody can have their own cost function and their own constraints. So like you can encode different, like basically different driver behaviors. So they might have different goals. They might have different, you know, I don't know, aggressiveness levels or whatever you'd encode in this cost function, right? Um, okay. Cars, cool. So that makes sense. So that's everybody's, every car has one of these problems. But if you look at this, right, as I just wrote it down, like if I were to, you know, kind of, compute the first order necessary conditions for this problem, like the KKD conditions for just for this problem, I'm only minimizing over UI here, not all the U's. So this ends up looking like an underdetermined system, right? Like it's got more variables than KKD conditions. So I can't solve it for just car eyes. But what happens is if I do, if I write this problem down for everybody, then I write down everybody's KKT conditions and I stack all the first order necessary conditions for everyone's problem, then it turns out I get a square system. So I can jointly solve this. I can jointly solve all N problems for all N cars together. And then I get a consistent problem that I can actually solve. X bar is only common for all. X bar is all the cars trajectories. Uh, and so what I end up doing is I get, I, ba I basically get one of these, one of these problems for each car. And in each problem, I'm only optimizing over that car's controls, right? Um, and that's not enough KKT conditions to uniquely determine the whole answer. But if I do that for everybody, if I write down first order necessary conditions for each problem for each car and stack all of those, then I basically end up with the same number of first order necessary conditions as variables, and I get a square problem that I could solve. Um, in practice, like, does that end up working out very well? Because like, if you don't know their cost functions or something. Like yeah, that, then... this is a key question. We're making assumptions, right? But you do this all the time. Do you know exactly how the other driver is going to respond when you do something? No, all right? Like you, you do not. 
And so like, this is like, I mean, people do weird crap all the time, right? So this is 100% like a model and assumption that we're making. Um, you know, we're making this assumption that everyone's acting rationally. We're making assumptions that we know something about their collusion avoidance behavior, their goals, blah, 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 right? You don't know this. Um, you could imagine trying to estimate these things online. So you could solve an inverse optimal control, inverse RL, whatever you want to call this weird thing, problem to try to estimate the other driver's cost functions. This is something we we would do, right? So you, you might say, oh, this guy's driving like crazy, speeding, whatever. I'm going to stay away from them. Like we do this stuff, right? The problem here um, is that if you're just like passing somebody on the highway, you need a very strong prior. If you have no data, if you've never seen this person before and you don't know anything about them, you're completely acting on assumptions. You have a strong prior about what most people will drive like, and that's what you're basing everything on. You can try to update that prior online given seeing some stuff. But the, the key idea here is you have basically very limited data. You have sparse data in a real, real world driving scenario. So you need to make lots of assumptions about them. Given data, you can try to update that model somehow. So like you can have a few cost function parameters or something that you can like try to update, but it's hard to like, you know, build a full model because you have just super limited data if you're just like passing someone on the highway, right? Um, you need the interaction. Yeah. Um, is there a horizon for this problem? Like, are we assuming how far we are thinking ahead of this? Yeah, this is all like kind of assuming receding horizon, like MPC kind of stuff where you're looking ahead some distance based on you know, so you're, you're basically always just looking locally around you and looking at the other drivers you can see with your sensors and then like setting this up based on, I can see, you know, there's four or five cars around me. I can see this far ahead on the road. And that's kind of the, yeah, the idea. Which I think is pretty reasonable. That's kind of how we do it, right? Like, um, it might not be the same horizon other drivers. No, that's 100% true. Yeah. This is more for you. I have to, I have to know where they are. You know, I need some way of estimating their, their, you know, state, their current state, which you do like that, you know, vision, LIDAR, radar, blah, blah, blah. Like you can track the other cars. Like we do this now. If that answered that question, is that not satisfying? I guess like when you're driving, you're not no, you you would just do this with like nearest neighbors that you can actually observe. Okay, so Whoever's near you. Dimensionality is probably for sure, yeah. Depending on how many cars you add to the problem, it gets bigger. Yeah. 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 So here you're basically trying to find a natural equation. Right? Yes. Yeah. So would the separation principle still hold in that context? Like uh definitely not. No, it doesn't in general. Like even in benign problems, yeah. Well, because like for a single car, like open the predictions for other cars. Yeah. yeah. So that's making it cool. No, yeah. I mean, it totally doesn't. Yeah. But we're going to assume it anyway, because that makes it more tractable. All right. So we're like kind of getting out of time. So I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to hang out more. I just want to say a few more things and I'll show you the video of this working. Um, so we get basically, just to finish the thought, we get N sort of number of cars. Um, problems that we have to solve simultaneously. And um, the kind of like classic interpretation of this, which comes from, again, economics, uh, is that no player in the game, so no, no driver, can unilaterally improve their cost. So that's like the definition of a Nash equilibrium. It, it's equivalent to like a stalemate. Basically, I can't do anything on my own to get to get any lower cost. Uh, so this is a standard model in economics. Again, it's it's like a good model. We think of non-cooperative behavior. Um, and yeah, like. The cost functions here can capture driver behavior, like aggressiveness.
Okay, and um, how do we solve this? Um, on brand for, for us, I guess, it's uh, an augment of Lagrangian method. We call that Al games. And basically what you do is you form the augment of Lagrangian for all of those problems. You put the constraints you know, with the augment of Lagrangian. Uh, you take the first order necessary conditions of all the problems, you stack them all, you do Newton, augment of Lagrangian, blah, blah, blah. So I'll write this out, but in the interest of time, um, that's what you do. Uh, you just stack them all. Um, it's gonna, I'll just, I wanna show you the video because it's fun. Um, and then I'll, I'll write that down. But basically this is from our paper on this a couple of years ago. Um, showing you kind of some weird, interesting things that come out. We were able to do this for like half a dozen cars at like 30 or 40 hertz. Uh, so you can do it. You can definitely do this in real time. This is like the rent merging stuff uh, that I was talking about. We have some better demos of this with like more traffic. Uh, yeah, it's like pedestrians at an intersection. Uh, I think the next one is maybe a better, the nudging frozen robot problem. Uh, yeah, here you go. So they're like, you know, there's not space kind of thing. We find that our algorithm solves dynamic games. I'm like trying to have the car kind of reason about what its actions are going to do. You know? 99.5% of the cases, our games is able to find a mesh equilibrium solution that satisfies the constraints. This illustrates. Oh, I don't know. You can get these like interesting behaviors out of this. Uh, yeah, this is kind of showing you the predictions. For these things, like what it thinks the other driver is going to do, you know, kind of fun. Oh yeah, so this is the frozen robot. So like, if it's not able to predict these, it just has to slow down and wait for all three of them to go by. The one over here, like before the tunnel, eat this one. It's terrible. Yeah, I don't know. Some, yeah, so then this is what you know the the game theoretic version does. It like figures out basically that it can nudge the other car and kind of force its way in. So I don't know. That's it. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a bunch of that. That's maybe the there's like assumptions here, right? You're assuming the other cars see you. And are going to kind of respond in a symmetric way. Um, so whatever. But yeah, I think the bottom line is like you can kind of uh, you can kind of bake. This is the paper if you care. Um, yeah, there's a follow-on paper called Lucid Games where we try to estimate the other drivers' cost functions online, which is kind of fun. Um, cool. So so if you want to hang out and talk about this, I'm happy to. I'm going to like write down the the rest of the setup. But yeah, punchline is. Stack them all, augment of Lagrangian for constraints, first order necessary, take the gradient, set it equal to zero, and solve the whole stacked set of problems with Newton simultaneously. All right, guys, catch you next time.